Since NATO are sort of still a power in the land, just for a bit more, uh, we'll start with, uh, with Don McMedley, who's been the spokesman and media advisor to uh, the NATO senior civilian representative in Afghanistan for three years, just finished in the summer, so he's back here now, but he's been in Afghanistan for a decade, more than you know, 10 years or so. Uh, and so he's going to help us just for the for, for a broad sort of uh, sweep on where NATO is and what's going on uh, at that sort of uh, strategic level. Thank you very much, Owen, and good evening, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience here, which just shows you that we know there's something in the water in Afghanistan. People keep coming back to the country and to discuss the topic that has absorbed so many of us since uh, 2001. Um, perhaps I should just go back to my last three years, the, the mothership, as it were, for me, for the NATO job for the last three years, and lay out where NATO is going what's been agreed. Um, at the end of next year, 2014, ISAF, International Security Assistance Force, that mission comes to an end. It has been agreed that there will be a new mission called Resolute Support. That was agreed at Chicago, the summit of NATO heads of state last May. And that will be a train, advise, and assist mission. It will be a lot smaller, it will be very different, and it will not be a combat mission under NATO auspices. And this is the culmination, really, of the so-called transition process that was worked on in the Lisbon summit in November 2010. The transition process of handing over security responsibility <coughs> to the Afghan army and the Afghan police, the ANSF, the Afghan National Security Forces. And that transition process began in March, in the Afghan New Year of 2011, with the presidential announcement by President Karzai that his forces were taking over responsibility for security in 25% of the country. And there's been five announcements since then. The last was on June the 18th this year. And the Afghans now have responsibility for about 90% of the country. And ISAF is moving to supporting, uh, very much a support role, not a combat role. And we've seen the Afghan security forces really taking the insurgency head on and losing sometimes 50 to 100 personnel every week at ISAF headquarters, the yellow building in Kabul. Every Sunday we had a memorial <coughs> service where the names of the very few international soldiers would be read out and an Afghan colonel or an Afghan general would step forward and just read out a number, as I say, sometimes more than 50 or 100 a week. Um, but a very poignant ceremony um, every Sunday. So that's the, the NATO transition process at the moment. Um, it's about 97,000 international troops at the moment. We know there's another big group of Americans, I think 20 to 30,000, who should leave by February. So perhaps for the April presidential elections, ISAF would be 40 to 50,000. Um, but still, and this is very important, combat ready with the ability to carry out combat until the end of 2014. The one thing about the new mission after 2014, of course, is that a status of forces agreement will still have to be negotiated with the Afghan government. And that, of course, needs to come in behind the bilateral security agreement that the Afghan government needs to negotiate with the United States. Uh, so that's really where we all uh, now, from the NATO perspective. Just one other thing I'd like to add to give you an idea of the complexity. In my three years at NATO headquarters in Kabul, um, I was there when there were four commanders of ISAF, four deputy commanders of ISAF, I worked directly to three NATO ambassadors, three military spokesmen, 
five chief of staffs for communication. In my 11 and a half years in Kabul, there have been 15 commanders of ISAF, only two doing more than 16 months. And only until March, sorry, only until May 2006, when General David Richards took over, did he do nine months. All previous commanders did six months. In that time as well, there have been seven American ambassadors, seven British ambassadors, six UN special representatives. There have even been three popes in the last 11 years. <laughs> two UN Secretary Generals, three British Prime Ministers, three NATO Secretary Generals, and one President Hamid Karzai. So the important thing for me when I left Afghanistan in June, and I know I'm going to go back, everyone says to you soon, is that the whole thing has to be about the Afghans, because ultimately it is their country, and they need to work out their future uh, with the support that the international community has given over the years. So I'll, I'll leave it there. But that shows you the complexity of strategies, and policies and implementations and great new ideas. At least the transition strategy is something that everyone has signed up to in November 2010. Just one question for me before we move on. How many international troops would you expect in 2015? Um, no number has been agreed, um, as far as I know, even in the last three months. But most people were working towards eight to 12,000. Some in the US military were advocating publicly some 20,000. But the mission certainly at the moment has been agreed that it's a lot smaller training at regional and national levels, and no combat by NATO. That doesn't mean individual countries will not carry out combat or counterterrorism missions themselves. Okay, thank you very much for that. And let's move on to Amal now, Amal Fasale, who is with the BBC Pashto Persian Service, comes from Afghanistan, lived in Pakistan for a bit as, uh, in your youth, and now uh, here in, in London for many, many years. So. Why don't you give us your take on 2014 security, elections, what's coming up? Sure. Um, everyone is whether troops are uh, capable of securing Afghanistan after 2014. The very brief answer to this is yes, but um, we have to look at the definition of security. What is security? I'm from Kunduz. Kunduz is a, a town in the north of Afghanistan. My father tell me that uh, some 40 years ago, in that town, there was a man called Daoud. He was drowned, and uh, rumors were that somebody pushed him. And uh, the whole town was uh, gossiping and saying the police is not capable, security is not here, and so on and so forth. The same city now, when there is 10 people dead and uh, 15 injured, People say it's a good day today. So um, the definition of security, if you go to that 40 years ago, forget about it. That, that's not going to happen. But uh, this other one that uh, unfortunately 10 get, uh, dead and 15 injured, uh, that will happen. And we have to remember also that uh, in the past 40 years, always, especially in the past 10 years, uh, with all the international troops there in Afghanistan, uh, the urban areas were secure, apart from the 10 dead and 15 injured with rockets and suicide attacks. And the rural areas were uh, insecure, or there was fighting going on over there. So I believe, uh, unfortunately, the same thing will happen, that uh, time to time, some small town might uh, be like a cat and mouse game over there with the uh, Afghan security forces, but overall, the major urban areas will be secure and Afghans will have the same security, but not the security that we call it security. And the elections? Um, elections are going to happen. Um, we have the usual suspects uh, for the uh, election. Again, when I say usual suspects, uh, I mean the warlords, um, those uh, uh, people that uh, in the past 10 years, everybody uh, heard of them. Uh, there might be some new faces also. There are those that are going to contest, but they know that they are not going to win. But right at the end, they will uh, withdraw with the hope of getting a cabinet seat. And uh, there will be those who know that they will not win and they will not uh, get a cabinet seat, but they will hope that one day in the history, they will be known as those who, who are contesting the presidential election. And there are a very few, probably two to three people, 
who yeah. may win the election. And uh, among them, a surprising name is Zalma Rasul, Dr. Zalma Rasul, who is the current foreign minister of Afghanistan. Um, he is apparently somebody who is backed by Karzai. If that's the case, there is uh, pretty much a big chance of him winning the election. Apart from him, Dr. Ashraf Ghani, uh, who has a lot of support among the Afghan educated people, but uh, his uh, luck is uh, going to end there because we don't have much educated people. Uh, and uh, the other guy is uh, Dr. Abdullah, that uh, these three are the main uh, candidates, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and now just a statement from uh, Michael Semple, who was, which is a name I guess many of you will be familiar with. He's just been in uh, Harvard for many years and now is moved to, has moved to Belfast, Queen's University of Belfast. And uh, I just asked him how long it was since he'd been in Afghanistan. He said, that's the wrong question. It's how long will it be before he goes back, which may be not so long now, I guess. And uh, he said the topic he'll talk on is what does it all mean? Good to see you. I, I find it very difficult to talk about Afghanistan. Uh, I, I feel I'd like to, to take something from my sister-in-law, who's a professional dancer, and you have, to, you have to touch the earth before you can start. Try and, try and be humble. And trying to make sense of what it all means, I think that people on all sides of the conflict I mean, are, are asking this question, um, you know, what did our martyrs die for? And there are many sides for this conflict, and every one of them asks that question. And when I try to, to work out how, we'd, um, yeah, how to, sort of tell, you know, tell the story of what's happened over the past 15 years, not just the past 12, the past 15 years in Afghanistan, of course, there is no one narrative that sells it all. There are lots of competing narratives that all intermingle in Afghanistan. I thought of uh, one of the Afghan leaders um, that you just sort of refer to as the, you know, the, the warlords, we know, but somebody who I've met, dealt with, talked cordially, seriously over, the, over all those years, over the past 15 years. How about 15 years ago, he and I were sitting up in the mountains when he was one of the leaders of the resistance against the, uh, the Taliban, and he said, why are we still fighting? Uh, you know, here we are, our old allies are now our enemies, our enemies are now our allies. And I said, remember, you're fighting for human rights and democracy, and you must never forget. Um, he more or less... A year or two after that, he more or less predicted September 11th because he was acutely aware of the, the role that Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda played. Um, uh, and he could see it coming, and I, I caught him on tape. And so, very rapidly, he was projected as a situation, rather he and I you know, talking up in the mountains um, in his front where he's fighting against the Taliban, uh, I took his first, photo his first passport photograph in the ministry building while he got his, uh, his passport issued to, to do his, his first ministerial tour. I sat with him while he actually had the map on the floor and planned a new province inside Afghanistan. We talked through the principles of... Uh, politics without guns, how DDR can proceed, and how it can now Afghanistan can have politics without the threat of the, the gun. We talk the realities of both the, so the, the power brokering that goes on, of course, deals in the, in, the, in the back rooms, and also mass politics. The same person went on to get the single largest personal, personal tally in free elections uh, inside Afghanistan. I, and I think Mar Martina also, we, so we, you know, we sat in his, you know, his fancy car, his fancy old car, as he wandered around Kabul, and then he led religious commemorations, which were a visible sign of religious freedoms which the country hadn't seen. We did, I mean, I sat through you know, from, you know, various of his power-broking discussions where he works out what deals can we cut with warlords of the other ethnicity. Do we sit with, do we work with Karzai or do we not work with Karzai? One day Karzai is telling me, ha-ha, you met with my enemy, and the next day Karzai is making him a minister again. The, and last month, in a, uh, an event that I participated in, he delivered the, uh, the keynote address on the issue of reconciliation, and he plotted out uh, a way in which it was possible to try and end the conflict by trying to bring the, uh, the Taliban uh, in from the cold. And tonight, he's sitting doing precisely the power-broking which is required in just making this key decision of who do they back. 
It might be Abdullah, it might be somebody else, but the decision that he and people like him, who have obtained a popular mandate, even though in some quarters they, uh, they are detested, and I also sat with him while we talked human rights dossiers and what happened in the 90s, the decision that they take decides the character of Afghan politics over the next while, and for people like him and the constituency that chooses such people as their leaders, they see it again as a matter for survival. So, I mean, there's a story there, I think that a lot has happened in Afghanistan. It hasn't, what's been achieved hasn't conformed to the expectations either of Afghans or the different foreign constituencies been in there, who have been there. Something's happened. Some of it has, some of it has been good. If I drew lessons for, uh, for interventions elsewhere, I would say scrap the approach to intervention, absolutely rethink it. Don't for the life of you think of taking Afghanistan as a model for anything that happens elsewhere. And also try and appreciate the good things which have happened and those which have been achieved, try and cherish and nurture those, and also watch as Afghans make some sense of it and actually find their way out of this as they go forward, as I'm sure that they will do, and learn some of those lessons. I mean, learn this lesson about the incredibly exaggerated, um, f uh, exaggerated sense of importance of the foreigners there. And I mean, if you, know, if you don't close me off now, the, the last, the one in I want to say, I sat, I mean, I sat actually in the Pentagon where a general came back saying, oh, and I, I want to report on the progress of training the ANA. We're doing so well supporting there. And I, and I sat with an Afghan who said, who said to me, thank you, general. The answer is 10. I said, what do you mean the answer is 10? He said, he said I have 10 fingers. And because of your numeracy, because of your numeracy program, I now know it. <laughs> <laughs> and that they, and I just, and I was sitting, I was sitting there, and there were some Afghan, there were some Afghans sitting in the room, and I was just ready to explode. I said, he was joking. <laughs> and, but the general took it completely seriously. So, <laughs> so exaggerated sense of self-importance, monstrous waste. I mean, oh God, don't get me going on the monstrous waste. The incredible tendency to have fantasy. God, we've been fantasizing about so many things. I mean, I hope, I mean, yeah, so much of what we've been doing was just never, ever real. But I think uh, a lasting, I mean, it's, it's, it's a regret, but it's also a challenge, is we didn't end the conflict. We didn't end the conflict. It's still ongoing. And as NATO, uh, as NATO steps out, it hands on the conflict to the Africa. And that's not good enough. And everything that we should have done and didn't is also acceptable, and what we should do is focus on ending the conflict. But you're saying politics can work? Politics is, politics is working. I mean, politics is certainly happening. And they, I mean, I certainly have hope. Of course, there are a few disaster scenarios, but I do have hope. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, now, fourth of our five uh, opening remarks from uh, Martin van Bylet, who is with the Afghanistan Analyst Network, a very international background, like quite a few people on the panel, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, you've been working with the EU as well at some points, I think. So, over to you. Yeah. Um, well, it's an interesting time now. Uh, people are looking forward and they're looking back, both Afghans and foreigners. And, uh, well, first of all, trying to figure out what happened in these last years, what was it worth, um, and where are we going? And above this question of where are we going, there's this looming wait of 2014. Ever since that was uh, announced as the date of the troops leaving, um, it became this, this huge... Um, almost like a disaster scenario, both among Afghans and among <coughs> foreigners. Uh, there, was this, there was this whole um, sense of trying to figure out, trying to read the signs of, of, uh, of what, what was going to happen. Um, among foreigners, uh, the, uh, what you see is a, a, a public sort of brave face um, being upbeat, trying to complete this narrative of the transition that's on track. Um, uh, and, that, and that, that it's going to hold, um, but privately a, a very pessimistic, often very gloomy outlook. And sometimes it actually sounded as if the sun was going to stop shining. Uh, 2014 was going to be um, the end of things. And what you noticed uh, more and more recently uh, among Afghans, that there's a pushback uh, toward, uh, against that. And this sense of it's not going to be like that. Um, First of all, Afghanistan is still going to be there, obviously. Things will still continue. And there's more and more this sense coming up of 
um, maybe we'll be all right. Maybe things will just continue the way they are. They'll change a bit, they might get a bit worse, but not as disastrous as, as everybody seems to think. And so where we had the fear of what's going to happen um, and the disappointment of what didn't happen and, and this sort of deep sense of pessimism among a lot of the foreigners, among Afghans, I'm actually sensing something of, this is also a new time, something new is going to happen. Um, uh, in which the relationship is between Afghanistan and the rest of the world is going to change as well. Uh, and um, not always be on the receiving end of the rest of the world that's trying to fix Afghanistan. Obviously, that's not the whole mood. There is a lot of concern as well. Um, and it's also the, you see most optimism among um, the younger generation, and in particular the younger educated generation, um, often boys and girls with, with good jobs, um, who tend to be in control over their lives. So that also uh, feeds that sense. Um, but the, the, the sense of, of pessimism in Afghanistan, I think, is a lot less than among a lot of the international um, uh, analysts. Disaster, uh, fragmentation, uh, deep conflict is definitely a possibility. It's one of the scenarios. It's not the default scenario. Uh, and I think in a lot of the analysis, there's, there's much um, emphasis on what goes wrong. There's a lot of emphasis on the sources of tension. Uh, and what's often left out is um, uh, you know, all the dynamics that are going on and that are actually mitigating violence and that are m mitigating tension. And, and for all the politicians and commanders that are spoiling um, and that are provoking, um, there's continuously people going around trying to um, defuse conflicts. Uh, and so um, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm optimistic. I think that's, that's a bit too much. Um, but there is, I do have this sense of pushback. Um, you know, give Afghanistan also a bit of credit for, for what it can do. Uh, I think related to that, one of the big um, lessons I think that need to be learned is that we as the West and as people who are interested in Afghanistan should stop just looking at Afghanistan as our um, sort of personal or communal either failure of su or success. Um, I mean, that's often the question um, that you get, did we succeed or did we fail? As if it's all about us. Um, and I think it's, it's, you know, it's, um, it's maybe not ours to fix. We have a role there. We have a presence there. We have a responsibility. We, we did things wrong. Um, but we're not sort of these you know, these, these, these people in control and trying to fix it from above. And, the, and uh, I think also the point that Michael made, I think greater humility is what's needed, but also much more um, a, a sense of understanding of, of the fact that we're, uh, that we're part of it, that we're also part of the problem, that we're not just detached somehow um, and working on it. Uh, I, th I think the last um, comment I'll just, I want to make in this, in this short in introduction is that one of the big things that stay with me looking back over all these years in Afghanistan is we as the West have not learned the lessons that we should have learned. Um, when we're looking at, uh, at Afghanistan, a lot of people uh, come to the conclusion that what we tried has failed um, and what we tried was maybe not possible, which I think might be the right conclusion, um, but that it was not possible because Afghanistan was not ready or that we tried something that wasn't suited for Afghanistan, or that Afghanistan, Afghans were somehow not interested um, in democracy. And I think that's the wrong conclusion. Um, as far as I understand, most Afghans understand democracy very well. Um, the fact that you can choose who rules you, and that the, facts that, that the fact that people who are in power also have to follow the law um, and cannot just abuse uh, their power, I think that's very well understood. Um, the disappointment is, is that people felt that they didn't get democracy, that this is not democracy, what they have now. Um, so I don't, I don't think that was the issue. Um, it, so I think that's the, 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 the wrong conclusion. The, the, what we tried to do was highly ambitious and we we're trying to do it through institutions and systems and a whole way of doing change management that's just not suited for the task. You don't, you cannot change things by making policy. Um, and then after you've made policy by spending money on it. That's just not how you can solve um, deeply political issues. Uh, and so I'm, I'm quite concerned that, I mean, there is a, 
a reluctance to get involved in another big um, uh, endeavor like that. But if we do, we'll still do it through the same systems. We'll still say, send the same UN agencies and, and we'll still start organizing the same kind of conferences and we'll still, it will still be in the same way. Um, you know, we'll still sp design programs and spend money and then uh, we haven't learned, we haven't learned the big lessons. Okay, thank you very much. Let me just push back on one thing you said. You're saying there are grounds for hope, at least many the, the observers see it. But what about you know, the very likely outcome, surely, that regional powers will get involved, local groups will reach out to those regional powers, and it will get very messy and very violent? Yeah. Um, I do think it will get messy and it will get violent. Um, or, or, uh, let's, there will be messiness and there will be violence. The big question is, will, every, will everything fragment and will, we, and will we see it fall apart again? And a lot of the talk um, among international analysts is, is seeing as, as what we see now is a route towards that. And I don't think that. I think there's a good chance that somehow the country will muddle through. In practice, muddling through and falling apart will in some ways look quite alike. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that it's going to be fine or great, or it will still be very ugly and very messy. Um, but uh, yeah, politics will go on, people will go on with their lives, and the main thing is, will the center hold? You know, will the idea of government hold? Um, will, will the system get more time to stabilize itself? Thank you very much. Hope you're all preparing questions as uh, we go along with this. We'll be, we'll be uh, throwing it open for too long. But finally, we're coming to Karamana Kaka, who worked as a gender advisor for the Afghanistan Peace and Reconciliation Program, the High Peace Council, worked with USAID, and uh, actually won the UN 2012 Role, Role Model for Peace Award. So you're very welcome, and you've uh, got some remarks I can see you've, you've prepared. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be part of this important event. I would like to start with denoting and recognizing some of the achievements of the past 12 years. Um, for example, our achievements in education, economic empowerment, infrastructure development, civil society empowerment, youth development, and we, if you specifically talk about women, which has been one of the reasons for the international community to focus on Afghanistan, is that we have had great achievements in regards with women development and participation. It is very obvious from the statistics that the education rate among women has increased largely. The health status of women has improved. Increasing number of women participating in the social political fields um, in Afghanistan. Um, and there's also an increasing voice of women in the political process, especially in the current peace and reconciliation process. But if I'm to point out some setbacks as well, such as corruption and nepotism. I would blame these on all stakeholders involved in Afghanistan, including the Afghan government and the international community, for letting it happen, starting from orchestrating um, to form an interim and transition administrations out of four lot. But then when we come to post-2014 and the rumors that breed um, fear in ordinary Afghans about the collapse of the current system with the withdrawal of troops, both American and other international troops. I see it merely a negative propaganda. I, as an Afghan who has a very indigenous understanding of my country and first-hand experience of the mishaps of the 1980s and 90s and the extraordinary achievements which we have had over the past decade, I can very much I can confidently assure it to myself and to Afghans all around that we are not going to end up back into the 1990s era. We are not going to have another civil war and we are not going to have Taliban back coming to, to power again. This is to those who introduce the current insurgency as civil war, I would say that it's nothing more than a regional proxies terrorizing Afghans. Under any definition, it cannot be, the current insurgency cannot be defined as, um, as a civil war. Although we don't have adequate, um, well-equipped or trained um, national security forces, but I can tell that we are proud of 
of the Afghan National Army who can take care of, of the country. And the fact that we will have US bases in the country, uh, which I consider as an assurance um, against the disintegration of the current system. And by saying that, I would say that Afghanistan has a brighter future, but it depends on how, how the current transition process going, goes on. It depends on good governance, stable economy, and continuity of democracy. Continuity of the current system. We have elections after a few months, presidential elections, and that is, I call, continuity of the current system, continuity of democracy and democratic process. What we don't want to have at present is that we don't want to have another, we don't want to change to another system through another exhausting process of revolution that Afghanistan has been going through for the past 50 years. We would like to continue with the same system, but reforms within the systems are very much essential. We, as individuals, as Afghans, we want to see ourselves empowered by choosing who we want to, who we want to rule us in the country. I see people fighting their civil uh, their their fights through civil uh, through civil movements, and and that is far more civilized. Um, than Afghans were ever aware of. Um, I would like to conclude my remarks here um, because we are coming back to the okay. discussion. Well, there is a question I want to just ask you that follows on from what a lot of you have said, talking about politics, development, even corruption, lots of normal things happening. Uh, but none of you are really talking about what all the journalists are asking about and what a lot of the diplomats seem to be uh, concerned about, which is, are the Taliban going to be in the new government? And you know, that would seem to be where, where I sit an important question. Maybe it's the wrong question. Uh, do any of you have views on that? Personally, I don't think so. Um, even if there is a um, peaceful solution, I don't think Taliban will come into power or uh, join the government. Uh, they might be somewhere there enjoying a good life in Kabul, but I don't think they will join the cabinet. But that would have quite significant implications for security, wouldn't it? No, if, if they um, agree with the peaceful solution, they will, as I said, uh, enjoy a better life in Qatar or in Kabul, but they will not join the cabinet because that will end their political movement, basically, by joining the government and the people that they denounce as uh, whatever. Yeah, it, it, it's not on the cards at the moment that they would be joining the government anytime soon. Um, it's, it's the kind of thing that's being talked about very easily when you look at it from a distance. And it sort of seems as the logical thing to happen if you're starting a peace process, so of course at some point they'll join the government. Um, it's, it's just maybe at some point, but not based on the processes that are there now. I mean, there's not actually really a peace process going on. Um, there's efforts to get something started. And so whenever something happens that might be seen mm. as part of a peace process, it gets a lot of attention in the media and often it's, it's nothing yet. There is very little there. There's something that could become something. Um, but yeah, so I don't see it anytime soon. It, just one thing, it might happen, and I think that's actually the fear of many Afghans, that something might be fixed up um, because it looks so logical and good from the outside and it would be su such a nice addition to the whole transition package to have that um, political deal in there as well. And so there's, there's this fear that something gets fixed up that's not real but m might have real consequences. Well, I would um, somehow disagree with the point of views of my colleagues. Um, I've been working with, uh, with Afghanistan Peace and Reconciliation Process um, as a gender advisor. And um, as I was consulting Afghans around the country, all of them, I mean, nobody denied their, their contribution in the governance system, Taliban's government. The only thing they wanted was they didn't want their family members to be killed anymore. Majority of Afghans. But as we talk about their participation in the, gov in the government, I would say it's something inevitable for the government and the international community. We cannot avoid, um, we cannot deny the fact that they cannot be part of the government because they Otherwise, they won't be continuing with their, um, with their operations, with their, which they are continuing right now. But 
I think there will be no peace without having them including, included in the system. Yeah, That's I mean, the insurgency goes on. If, yeah. Uh, mm. Yeah. Um, I think it's right that we're still a long way from there. And it may well be that um, you know, Karamana gives a, uh, an accurate view of the future. But it's a long, you know, there's a long road to be travelled first. One of the reasons that it's a long road is this classic thing about um, uh, differences of expectations. If you were to ask me, so very private, I might say it in front of a crowd, but they, I would probably say that, they, um, uh, that I think the Taliban have got a very specific constituency. They do, I mean, they do have some, you know, some roots in Afghanistan. They're not only proxies of um, you know, Pakistan or whatever. That they, are, I mean, they, they have certain people who buy into, the, buy into their ideas and identify with their networks. They have a place in Afghan society, but it doesn't really count for a huge number of Afghans. I mean, they're, you know, it's a big country. There are lots of other people there. So uh, in terms of democratic politics, if you talk about you know, people getting into government on the basis of the number of votes that they can get in, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's never going to be a winner for the Taliban. Because they, you know, when, even in areas where Taliban do have some support today, when Afghans go to the polls, they've got other kind of people they tend to, they tend to vote for. So, they, so the Taliban are never going to get the votes, so and they're never going to get the mandates to be, uh, to be up there. So at the moment, the, sort of the, the significance of the Taliban is not um, their ability to somehow you know, complete the electoral piece. I mean, it's, of course, it's their spectacular success as spoilers. I mean, that they have been incredibly successful uh, at building up and then sustaining a, um, uh, an insurgency and rendering them impossible to ignore. Um, so the, so, the, um, the, you know, the, so the, potential, the potential thing of the, of the Taliban is to do exactly what Karamana is saying people pray they will do, uh, which is in a sense you know, to, stop, to stop killing, to stop making it impossible to do anything else. And of course, they're going to they're have their terms in it. But uh, of course, I mean, actually sealing some kind of deal where they say, okay, that's enough, we fought enough, and now we're coming on board, whether it be to send some people into different parts of government, it's not only the, minist it's not only the ministries, um, uh, or whether it be sort of somehow enjoying um, sinecures in the background, yeah, they'll try and strike, they'll try and, uh, strike a high bargain, and like you know, political actors everywhere, and particularly in Afghanistan, they've got an inflated idea of their own importance. If you ask them, please, um, you know, which cabinet posts do you think you should have, um, they say, well, everything except for perhaps yeah, so you can have social affairs. Um, so yeah, the, woman it's, affairs. It's, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, they say, oh, oh, we, we understand women. We've thought about it a lot. Um, they anyway, it's yeah, it's a long road to be travelled, but um, it's one that Afghanistan may well travel. And I can tell you, even over you know, even you know, over past weeks, as I've talked to you know, the Afghan players who I expect will be calling shots. Um, uh, you know, beyond May next year and the next, the next, Afga the next administration, they expect that they'll have to deal with the Taliban. And when I talk to Taliban, some of them really do think that they can go for broke and they can win militarily. And those who the whole don't thing. think, yes, the whole thing, yeah. topple the lot. Yeah. Some, some still believe that, and that's one of the things that drive the conflict. But those who don't think that realize that they're going to have to, they're going to have to make an adjustment. With yeah, but would policy. you agree with them all that they'll be content to? Yeah, not stay in power and just relax. I mean, that's surely not going to happen. The spoiler role will continue. Well, that's why I say about the, I mean, it's, well, it's the one thing is that the idea of a spoiler role, or even if they decide how to get out of the spoiler role, what's the right way? If I were to give advice to Taliban, as, you know, as somebody you know, respecting the place that some of them do have in Afghan society, I would say don't go for the cabinet positions because you'll never be content with it. They, they, they will not go. I mean, knowing the Taliban big figures, I mean, one is the ordinary Taliban, but the big figures, I don't think that they will join any government uh, other than Mullah Omar, uh, the chief. So what might happen is that a uh, new Taliban, which we never heard of, they might come and join and get some uh, polls, but not the big guns. Mm. Do you want to make I think, I just briefly, I mean, I remember a few years ago, there was always the discussion, the idea of carving up ministries, carving up governorships. It's never happened. Um, President Karzai is always putting out the olive leaf. I agree, I've never seen or been a tremendous fan of seeing too much towards peace and reconciliation. I know it's going on quietly. It's all part of the process, quiet, building bricks going on. It's good, let it happen. I've always thought as well, and, and, and the, some of the bosses I worked for thought that you're going to be stuck with this even in 2017, perhaps. After 2014, maybe you might have more of a chance. 
You don't have the largest propaganda recruiting tool, go and kill the infidels, go and kill the foreign forces. You don't have the so-called puppet government, Western backed of President Karzai. So maybe some new opportunities with a new government and the elections next year might open up more roads to more talk on this peace and reconciliation. I personally never believed that if Mullah Omar or Haqqani or Hekmatia gave a press conference and said, brothers, put down your weapons, that the whole country comes to a peace in one day. Actually, what did that last week was the football uh, win. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Right, now there's a microphone uh, at the back. Is there just one microphone? Uh, two. So that's splendid. So can you put your hand up? And I think it just makes things easier for people on the panel if uh, you do give them some idea who you are, because it's quite disconcerting otherwise. Right, there's one, one here. We'll start there and we'll come back to you. Yeah. Yeah. You go by hand waving. Can I switch on? <laughs> Can you hear? Not really. Try again. Keep talking. Right, I'll keep talking. That's, that's fine. Um, I'm Peter Owen. I'm a retired person. I used to work in development. My experience of Afghanistan was in the 70s when it was a, a happier place with a strong currency. Um, this is all very interesting, what we've heard from the, cap from the panel, but I wonder, could we have some more explicit comments on um, how they see the path to achieving a legitimate government in Afghanistan that has the support of the pe enough support of the people um, to bring an end to the conflict. Because some of the panel members seem to view the, the, the conflict in mainly military terms, whereas in fact um, you could view it as one of legitimacy. So how do you get a, a government with sufficient legitimacy and what kind of political deal do you see um, being necessary to achieve that? And if things go well, what would happen? And if things went badly, what would happen? And what would be the risks? For example, risks of um, one faction um, taking too much and alienating the others. Risks from drugs. No one's mentioned drugs. Drugs can be a very destabilizing influence. Um, okay. So could we, could we have some more um, analysis, I think, from the, from the panel? That would be very helpful. Yeah, okay, so, so it's all happening 2014. I mean, this, this is going to have to happen one way or another. Uh, what process has to happen to get a government in place that can be called legitimate? Why don't we start with you? Um, as I said earlier, uh, for me, the most important thing is the continuation of democracy. I, as an Afghan, I personally, based on my experiences in Afghanistan, I would be, I would be less, less concerned with with transparency in the election processes, for example, then to be concerned more about that elections should happen. So I think, in, I mean, in order to continue the democratic process, it involves people all around the country, whether that's political oppositions or armed oppositions. So when we, once we take that into account, when, once we say that we want to continue with democracy in Afghanistan, we need to p give people a platform, a space to, to peacefully contribute in the system. Free and fair elections would give legitimacy. What? Well, uh, I think election all over the world, nobody is uh, happy with uh, the result who is losing. Uh, in Afghanistan, in the past uh, 10 years, we had three elections, or four elections with the parliamentarian election. Every time there were some people uh, not happy. I don't think we will have 100% clear uh, um, election, clear in the sense that everybody is happy with it. But uh, I think the election is the only process. Uh, so you cannot say that this is not a legitimate government. I mean, even in 2009, when uh, especially Washington was saying that uh, the election is not that good, um, people accepted it at the end. So I think this is the only way to accept it. I think that one of the, well, the, you know, going the other way around, even if we don't believe that electoral legitimacy uh, is uh, sufficient to establish the legitimacy of an Afghan leader who can deliver all of these things, uh, the best way to delegitimize a leader would be to have a disastrous election. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's that, you know, it, that's that's also possible. So and what, what is disastrous election? Oh, it does, I mean, a disastrous election is whether the it's um, uh, think of yeah, you know, think of two thousand and nine, multiply and multiply by ten, uh, and a disastrous election is if is if it was 
uh, Afghans clearly understood from what they could see of the electoral process that somebody, somebody who commanded a majority in the country was deprived of victory by uh, outright blatant rigging. That's the, and of course, often, it's a, if, it's a fuzz, if it's fuzzy, then of course you can sell it. But if it's this bad as I'm talking about it, then you delegitimize. So you know, avert that situation. But there are lots of other things uh, in terms of, of legitimacy. What we've been talking about, transition, is of the, the narrative that an Afghan leader can come in in 2014 and basically give a narrative of self-reliance. You know, that they, um, you know, forget what's, you know, yeah, you know, forget the bad things which have happened in the past. Now we are Afghans standing on our own. So basically, I've, you know, uh, on the one hand, I've seen off the bad aspects of the foreigners' presence, but you know, we Afghans can hold up our you know, head in the international community. This kind of, uh, it, you know, it's an yeah. Afghan nationalist come into nationalist narrative. I think will be important uh, in uh, in establishing legitimacy. And I expect that any Afghan, uh, you know, any Afghan leader worth their salt will be. Uh, cultivating this kind of narrative. But of course, leadership effectiveness counts. If you put in somebody who simply just doesn't manage to appeal to the Afghan population, doesn't manage to come across as a good Afghan and an effective leader, that will be a major problem. And that they, I mean, that there's an element of it that I don't think anybody can really confidently give you the sort of the formula of what absolutely won't work and what does work. But there is, a concept of Af there is a concept of national unity in Afghanistan. And it's very difficult to say, what are the ingredients of Afghan unity? There are some people who can really can invoke the Afghan unity and symbolize Afghan unity and be leaders that Afghans from different parts of the country will buy into. And there's some people who just don't have it. So it's got to be somebody, somebody who can convince the population that they symbolize Afghan national unity will be necessary to, the, you know, to, to get the kind of backing that will help them deliver peace. Uh, do you want to say something? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, basically the question was, shouldn't we look at the conflict also in terms of legitimacy? Basically implying that you know, we're having, we have an insurgency because we have an illegitimate government. And that's a tricky one. Um, I don't think that's the way it is. I think the conflict has a dynamic of its own. There have been very important drivers of the conflict. I think in particular early on, um, when former Taliban and those who were not Taliban laid down their weapons and had expected to live in peace, um, were targeted and then started fighting the government. And that often happened at a very local level. Um, and so, yes, uh, parts of the insurgency are um, in a response to a government that was predatory and violent. Um, and so that is a key. But to say we have an insurgency because this, the central government um, or the president or the cabinet is illegitimate. I don't think that is the case. That's not, um, and, and because that implies also if we have a different government, um, the conflict might go down. I don't think that's a, that's a conclusion you can draw. Um, but there are very important sources of, um, that, that sort of weaken the legitimacy of the government. A huge one is corruption, which was already mentioned. Um, which is really a, a source of embarrassment uh, for, for many people in the government. Um, as I said before, the, the, the fact that the, the government, or at least people linked to government and linked to power, often violate the rights of people. Um, to some people, the fact that it's a foreign-backed government or that it's not a self-reliant uh, government. Um, those are important. I mean, if you want to... Uh, any government will... You know, if you want more legitimacy for the, for the government, you'll have to deal with that. On the other hand, there is this issue of this is the government that we have. Um, and, and everybody will complain about the government, including everybody who is in government will complain about the government and how corrupt it is. Um, but it is the government that the country has. And there is this fear of, you know, it, it could be worse. You know. Okay, yeah. Can you use the microphone? Just hold a second. Hello, hi. Um, my name's uh, Aleem. I, I, I work for uh, United Nations Peacekeeping. Um, I've worked in uh, Afghanistan for the UN mission there for uh, four and a half years. Uh, and um, I just wanted to ask uh, the panelists about uh, the role of Pakistan. Uh, and uh, uh, what role do the panelists see uh, with Pakistan? New leadership we have there? Yeah. What sort of role 
do you see Pakistan playing in uh, either increasing instability or uh, uh, helping to, to stabilize uh, Afghanistan? Madam Dominic, you're no longer an official, are you? No. <laughs> um, I did a press conference every week, and myself and a German general were always asked about Pakistan. We are extremely limited and tight on what we can say. I'll give you the official line, and then I'll give you some thoughts myself. Um, you want the unofficial line? I will give you the unofficial line as well. Um, but for me, on a podium in front of Afghan media, sometimes 100 journalists and cameras every week, Pakistan is an extremely difficult question, which NATO is very careful about. Um, it's the, the standard lines where it was a shared fight against extremism. The terrorists are coming to and from across the border. Pakistan also has its own tremendous difficulties to deal with as well. And for every single Afghan journalist, you're on a hiding to nothing. Um, because for most Afghan journalists, particularly off the record when, you vi when I visited newsrooms, they are so visioned about the influence of what Pakistan is doing. But I think we would all agree that NATO, ISAF, has a UN mandate in Afghanistan. No one is giving anyone else a new mandate to go across the border. That is done by drones, by one of the major nations, the major nations. And you've just got to keep the diplomacy going. And there's been horrendous uh, rifts between Islamabad and Kabul, and then it picks up again, and they all seem to be having meetings and stuff. Um, but what's going on in the borderlands, and I don't know that area very well at all, um, has a huge influence on Afghanistan. The Afghans blame a lot on Pakistan, and I can only think of stressing diplomacy, talking. Uh, we were j joking and uh, talking in the green room earlier about Northern Ireland and France and Germany. You know, unless there's an earthquake, Pakistan and Afghanistan will be next to each other for the foreseeable future. And quite frankly, the only people who are going to be able to work it out will be the Afghans and the Pakistanis. Um, you are not going to start another war. And this was with difficulty with the negotiating the United States agreement. Was America going to support Afghanistan if Pakistan attacked Afghanistan? Little simple questions like that. Pakistan does need to do more, without a doubt. There's something going on there. There is support to insurgents there. They're coming across the border. Uh, that's as much as I know about that. Um, it's very, very tough. So the question is, will the new government in, uh, in Pakistan change that policy? Um, for me, let's, first of all, about the perception of Afghans of Pakistan is that uh, if Radio Pakistan announced that today Frontline and BBC is having this conference here in London, Afghan will be, will be saying that, no, it is in Paris, not in London, differently. So this is the way that uh, Afghan think of Pakistan, that in everything they doubt about it, and uh, they have uh, good reason for that. Um, but uh, um, the current uh, Pakistani government of uh, Nawaz Sharif, there is a hope, a slight hope. Um, the slight hope is that uh, this person is a businessman. He, he had uh, his wars with the Pakistani army, so he's not with good terms with the Pakistani army. So in a way, wishful thinking that probably he is going to show them his face. And uh, also that uh, because he is interested in economy, he will be trying to get to the Central Asian market. So, uh, by the way, today they signed an agreement of uh, buying electricity from Kazakhstan and uh, Tajikistan, which will be coming through Afghanistan. So that sort of uh, feeling uh, then gives some hope that probably Nawaz Sharif's uh, current government might do something. But there is a big might. Of course, it's always difficult, and you can never, you can, yeah, you can never satisfy the different uh, sides to the the argument. Uh, I, I mean, I'm certainly optimistic to the extent that the, yeah, many people in Pakistan realise that the best way to stabilise their own country and to deal with this, the the, uh, the mounting security problems there is to play a helpful role in stabilising Afghanistan. Many people have realised that, and you know, now we we live in hope that we'll see it operationalised. When I try, when I try to understand it in a sort of a, in a, you know, in a, um, almost, almost sort of take the state out of it, uh, I think that the, you know, the lands, you know, really of the, you know, the Indus Valley from, you know, Kabul going downwards. These are, um, these are part of the, the sort of the social, cultural, and economic resources that the people in Afghanistan, you know, yeah, exploit, exploit in the positive sense. They take. 
that they draw, draw value from them. And everything they do, they organize there. So, I mean, uh, Afghans have got economic activities which take them all over the territory which politically we refer to uh, as, as Pakistan. So the resources, the places where Afghans know we have nephews, we have cousins, we have businesses, we have tra 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 travel agents, they came all the way down to Karachi and, of course, to Dubai and to London. Um, so uh, you know, there's no surprise that Afghan insurgents should be exploiting those resources to run an insurgency. I mean, of course they would. I mean, they, you know, the IRA exploited Irish, you know, Irish communities in the north of England to you know, maintain sleeper cells and so on. So there's no surprise that that should, uh, that should happen. But it is, of course, fundamentally, it is a common security problem. And the only reason that non-state armed actors are able to deliver their cocktail uh, of uh, organized crime with a veneer of religion superimposed and a few political ambitions there, is the only, a, their only reason they're able to do that is because they exploit the inability of state actors in adjoining countries to cooperate with each other. Mm. Uh, and you know, that's, you know, that's clicked in quite a few minds, um, and it may be operationalized in the next few years. Yeah, I, was, I mean, it's maybe just worth making a point that the Pakistan government is now talking to the Pakistan Taliban. There is a negotiation process on, and there is confusion in Pakistan about that, because there's been a military campaign for some years now. There's a process of negotiation going on, so that's conflicting. And there are debates within the senior leadership of the military about whether a Taliban in the government in Kabul is going to help the Pakistani Taliban or not. So it's all tied up. Those, the, the strategic thinking in Islamabad and Rawalpindi is, is, is confused, and they're trying to work out what it all means, what happens in Kabul means for them. But let me just go to you. Um, yeah, Taliban are considered by, by majority of Afghans as proxies um, of Pakistan. And as far as the Pakistan government is concerned, we need to think about how independent that Pakistani government is of its um, security agencies such as ISI. Because the foreign policy is often led by the ISI, especially when, when it's concerned with its neighboring countries, such as India and Afghanistan. So it's also the question of the independence of the Pakistani government or the, the liberty that to what extent would they be able to help Afghans to do during the peace process or to bring peace within Afghanistan and in the region. Um, there's always a question among Afghans that if, if it was possible to find out Osama in Pakistan, why is it impossible to find out um, Mullah Umar, for example? I mean, that guy being even more dangerous and under more security. So that's how Afghans often blame Pakistani establishments for there is a reason of increasing insurgency within the country and that Taliban have got, have gained power over time because of its neighbors, not only Pakistan, but also Iran. Okay. Uh, you, you, there, no, there are Hi, my name is Tony Knox. Um, my first visit to Afghanistan was in 1968. And on my way back, I, uh, I saw in a newspaper in Tabriz pictures of rioting in Derry, which I, I couldn't read the... the, the and on the way further back, I hitchhiked across what was then a stable Yugoslavia. I'd come from a stable Afghanistan um, and across a stable Yugoslavia. I'm just wondering what chances the panel think there are of balkanization in Afghanistan. To me, it seems 50-50 that there will be in, in some time a series of states in, 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 in Afghanistan. Okay, what I'm going to do now is, unless any of the panel have strong objections, is just try and get one person to answer each question so we get more people coming in from the audience. So why don't you deal with that? Balkanisation, 50-50, hmm. charts the question I said. Yeah. You're, you're touching on a very sensitive <laughs> issue. <laughs> why do you agree to answer it? <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, it's something that's being discussed rather lightly, I feel, outside of Afghanistan. Um, and which is uh, picked up very strongly inside Afghanistan. There's a, um, there's a suspicion and a fear that there's um, conspiracies going on, that there's um, hands behind the scenes that, are, that actually want to break up Afghanistan for whatever reason. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's talk which would be useful not to have it 
um, out, out there too lightly. I think the chances are less than we think. I think there's a much stronger sense of nation and of country than, uh, than a lot of outsiders uh, think. There's um, people very easily say, you know, Afghanistan has never been a nation, never been a single country. I think uh, that's not the case. Um, it, again, it's not, it is one of the possibilities, it's one of the scenarios. If the country fragments uh, in violence along ethnic lines, lots of things can happen. Um, but it's not an as easy or an as logical route as a lot of us think from the outside. I think it's quite a lot less than 50-50. Oh, no, I, have, I have to give this. I have to give one. It, 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 it's such a tender question. I have to, have to add. Sorry, I mean, break the rules. No, it's not going to happen. The chances are zero. Afghans are, the only thing that Afghans really agree on is that Kabul is the capital. They can't agree on who is going to be running the capital, but you know, it's just not going to happen. Throughout, you know... Th you know, three decades, three decades of conflict. There has never been a viable secessionist movement. Everything that people depict as you know, separatist movements, actually they are trying to, to gain a share of power in the mm -hmm. capital. The balkanization will not happen in Afghanistan. But there has yep. been some um, struggle from, from some of the political factions who were mostly supported by foreign hands, by, by non-Afghans, I should say. They were trying to promote decentralized, decentralized government within Afghanistan it, in, in the current circumstances. And the reason for that was to further weaken the rule of law in the country and to fragment, to, to enhance fragmentation within communities of Afghanistan. So that was something which was taken very seriously by, by majority of Afghans, that they didn't want decentralized system in current circumstances because it's, it's, it's a way to further decentralize or disfragment the, the Afghan nation, dividing them along ethnic lines. So, and that's something which has almost come to an end, this debate, particularly in Afga within Afghanistan. Yep. There's one here. Hi, my name's Nick. I'm from Plant for Peace, and we are setting up farming cooperatives across the nation uh, to bring in multinationals and buy produce from Afghanistan to give them a fairer price. And we've held jurgers um, with tribal elders and a lot of Taliban have said they'll put their guns down if we can help them make more money. So capitalism is clearly the way to bring peace. But I'm just changing the subject. I've got a question for Imad and Michael. Salam. Um, the Honorable Hanif Atma, what, what chance do you think he has of becoming president? And, uh, you know, a, an individual president, you know, compared to in Britain, for instance, Prime Minister can do, you know, very little to change anything, but in Afghanistan, can uh, a president have a real influence on bringing a, you know, peaceful country and more efficient economy? Um, Atmar is a great uh, uh, minister. He was a great minister. He was very successful with all the three ministries that he ran. Uh, but I'm afraid uh, um, his chances are slim. Uh, there are other people who, who are well ahead of him. Uh, on on the agriculture, yesterday I read a story that uh, uh, nearly 400 tons of Afghan onions are going to India for the first time. So everything is going good. <laughs> I think that was directed to you as well. Yeah, I think on the... Um, uh, I agree with Imal on the you know, on the sort of prospects, but the um, uh, there's a very interesting issue uh, on does does the the leader make a difference, uh, and I think that when we do the historical evaluation of Afghanistan uh, in a few years' time, not now, uh, I think that's one of the things that will um, that will emerge that um, uh, that the the. The leader, the leader makes a great deal of difference for better or for worse. Um, and I think that the, we'll have a bit more comparative material when we evaluate this um, from a perspective of several years' time. Um, but I think that the, um, uh, particularly the way that the system is constructed in, in Afghanistan at the moment, um, the, uh, a, an effective leader can make the difference between system paralysis and achieving things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
by the way, that onion went through Pakistan, so <laughs> Pakistan <laughs> went Very down well. the uh, yeah, thank you um, very, very much indeed. Uh, I had to have a wry smile at the comments that perhaps lessons weren't learned. Um, I worked for many years with uh, oh, sorry, colleagues who'd been in the Soviet Armed Forces in the 1980s in Afghanistan, and their descriptions were very similar with what we were hearing. And um, it seems from what you've said that sometimes the civilian aid has, hasn't always adapted to Afghan circumstances are hopefully lessons learned going forward. My question is, uh, has changed, preempted by other speakers about what the neighboring countries are going to do. I don't know if you want to answer those other than, of course, Pakistan, particularly Iran. But um, if the Taliban largely do disarm, um, what are their fighters going to do? Where are they going to go? Do you want to take that on? Yeah. Um, well, as part of the peace and reintegration process, um, one part of this particular program was to provide um, economic opportunities for, for, for the Taliban insurgents and others, other insurgents who are joining uh, the system. So there were several categories for several uh, categories of insurgents um, who were joining back the government. We had some of the leadership personnel who were working in the High Peace Council, a couple of them. And we had some other who, were, uh, who joined the government and they were um, hired in government positions where they were suitable. And there was a large program for foot soldiers, which unfortunately could not, was, was not very successful uh, when it came to implementation, but there definitely is a strategy of uh, integrating these Taliban who are reintegrating back into the, into the system. And there's also a group of new Taliban, which are young people joining insurgents for economic reasons. And there was a particular program targeting those, those um, young people, the youth, to, to keep them from joining the insurgent groups and to provide them with livelihood opportunities and economic improvement so that they can stay um, in, the, in their communities with their families. So people are thinking about it. Yeah, any more at the back? Yeah, if you could just do one of those. And then... Hi, uh, I work at the Committee to Protect Journalists and we're a global press freedom advocacy group. And I wanted to ask about the role of Afghan media, um, uh, uh, media their work under enormous risks and, um, uh, and there are fears that those risks will increase um, after next year. Um, yet the media is also crucial um, for the, through, the election peer, through the election process and to ensure governance moving forward. What should be done to protect and support the media and what role do you see there moving forward for the media? Right, media in, media in, in uh, Afghanistan, vulnerability, especially with these elections coming up. Uh, vulnerability in the sense well, of yeah, security. Physical, physical security. Yeah. For journalists, uh, I'm afraid the past 10 years were not that good. Uh, personally, um, uh, we at the BBC lost two colleagues, uh, one in Oruzgan and one in uh, Helmand, and rather three, if you go a bit more, one was in Kabul. So, um, and. <laughs> Every day we, we, we hear that uh, there are some harassment uh, by all sorts of people. Um, so for journalists, this is not uh, um, an easy country to, uh, to work in. Um, but um, just like security for any other uh, citizen in Afghanistan, there are worries for um, journalists. Um, and and um, security till the election, I think, election will happen and in some areas where there is less security, just like in the past two elections where there was no uh, election in certain areas, again there will be no election in certain, certain areas. Yeah. Covered there with your role. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is on women and how you secure the advances that have been made for women over the last decade. The other question is a bit more complicated. Um, it just seems to me you've glossed over a bit that we currently have almost 100,000 foreign troops in Afghanistan. In just over a year's time, 
we don't even know how many troops still. Um, Dominic talked about eight to 10,000. Some in the US have talked about the zero option. Um, also likely that there won't be any air support. Um, isn't that situation likely that it will just go back to the 1990s and you'll have warlords controlling local fiefdoms and we know that ISI still have its clients and you know the government might be talking about having negotiations but there are certainly others in Pakistan who see this as all part of a big plan and think that they've won and that the moment that the foreign troops leave that the Taliban will take over. Yeah, I mean, it does seem, I agree, that the panel doesn't reflect the view of a lot of the uh, journalists that, that there is trouble ahead. Mm. On, on the troop things, you're right, and many current and former U.S. generals are publicly advocating how many troops they want, and the upper level is 20,000. And in January, the, national security, the deputy national security advisor in Washington, before President Karzai arrived in Washington, said publicly, and he named himself Ben Rhodes, we're also considering the zero option before President Karzai even arrived in Washington. And since then, of course, there's been that huge uncertainty. Some people say 2014 was a huge uncertainty, announce your withdrawal date. Um, that date came from President Hamid Karzai. Um, by the end of his second term, he wanted full security responsibility in Afghanistan. And like Afghan colleagues have said, we're going to knock this 2014 thing aside and move on. It doesn't mean anything to us. It will be 1393, the Afghan year. Uh, so it's only a foreign date. Um, the troops, it would be great to say how many troops you've got. I'm sure it would be a real confidence, just like um, agreements with international countries, particularly with America, would perhaps solidify uh, more confidence now. But I think there still is time. And I also try and encourage Afghan friends that you can't measure the future success of Afghanistan by boots on the ground and number of dollars pledged at international conferences. That is not going to happen anymore. You are not going to get the millions and billions that you have had. Um, there need to be new ways to move forward on the confidence of the future and the commitment. And I think we've heard yeah. some of that as well. But yes, it would be great to say there will be 20,000 troops, and this is what they'll be doing. Some of that is there, and eventually military planners need to know how many troops will be there, quite frankly, because where they're going to live and what they're going to do. The Air Force is a, is a good point, and, and every ISAF commander has said that air power is a huge difficulty for the Afghan Air Force at the moment. It, it won't be ready until 2017. They're not going to get F-16 fighter jets. It's a huge training program. There's only 100 Afghan pilots who are anywhere near uh, capable of doing anything. Um, and it's very difficult lifting uh, troops, lifting the dead Afghan soldiers, lifting supplies. It's a massive operation. And that is a very difficult area. And I imagine air power and air lift will be a huge thing in the new mission. But it's not been announced. I think announced. the point is that 20,000 won't be enough, even if it were 20,000. Um, there's 352,000 Afghan security forces. It was 10 foreigners to one Afghan five years ago. It's now three to one. And as we heard, Afghans are increasingly becoming very proud of their security forces. They've seen them do stuff in very difficult situations. And that is the right thing uh, to be seen to do, that Afghans social media or elsewhere, are coming behind their army now, coming behind their police. But they need more equipment, and they're very vocal about what they need. And Afghan ministers of defense are very vocal that they need more air support. But the international community is also pledged to pay up to $5 billion a year to pay the Afghan security forces. So there are pledges and commitments there. Yeah, can I just... Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, the big question is... Uh, you know, does the departure of the international troops mean that everything is going to fall apart? I think that's basically the big question. Um, and the problem with pushing back to something is that, you know, you, you know, I don't mean to sound optimistic. I mean, I'm concerned. I think everybody who's involved in Afghanistan, it's a bit strange also to be suddenly on the optimistic side of things. You're optimistic when <laughs> you've been there so long. Yeah, that's exactly. That's what I feel. Yeah. I might be optimistic as a spokesperson because you have to say that. Uh, you've been there so long. You've got enough Afghan friends to know that no one's going to let this go to pot. Well, and the might. Afghans will keep it yeah. solid. The thing is, it might go to pot. <laughs> I'm not saying it. Um, but the big th thing is, will it automatically collapse? And I think that's the, that's the thing that I'm really trying to push back. It's not automatic. And it's very difficult to... to Basically, everybody's looking at the three scenarios from the past because it's hard to think of, of new scenarios. So we're looking at the 89 uh, scenario, at the 92 scenario, and at the 96. So we're looking at um, 
the, the 92 one, the Civil War, uh, 96, Taliban takeover, or 89, everybody think it's going, thinks it's going to collapse, and it didn't, um, until the money ran, ran out. And that's why the, the, you know, a lot of the governments are really trying to get together the money. Um, you need to still have that idea of government. You, you still need to have all the political factions that they, that they want to relate to the government. Um, the army, we don't know. I mean, the, the spin is that the army is ready, that the security forces are ready. Mm, maybe. Um, but we don't know what pressure does. They might buckle under the pressure. They might also just sort of gather together, and it's happening in some areas. So again, I'm not saying it won't fall apart. Um, but the automatic link is not there. It's not, if we're not there anymore, it's going to fall apart. I just work. had s significant achievements over the last decade, and we don't want to lose them at any cost. That's something that Afghan women and Afghan people are very clear about. Um, we have the constitution which protects women's rights, and it provides equal rights to women as men. We have certain other laws which are securing women's rights, such as the law of elimination of violence against women, which is under huge debate these days. Some say that this is because the government wants to please Taliban and they have put this law under threat, uh, which, might, which may be the case or which may not be the case. But then we have to see within the system, like at, at present we have people in the system who are not very well convinced about women's rights. So there, are, there is a lot which needs to be done still. It's not that we have fixed everything, but we still have to, do, uh, to go a long way in order to obtain in terms of women's rights and full participation in the society. And that also involves the international community, their continued focus on women's rights in Afghanistan, um, as well as Afghans are striving and struggling at the same time to obtain what they have planned to obtain. Can I also say, I'm really sorry, but one brief thing. Um, I think we need continued international attention for women's rights, but also we need to be really careful with that. Um, sometimes the international attention is unhelpful um, and is also focusing on things that don't necessarily really help, um, that play out very well in our own um, uh, constituencies. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a very tricky one. Yeah. Uh, I've never been to Afghanistan, but I've paid for it um, for the last few years. Uh, and uh, as much as I respect the Afghans' war weariness, I'm weary of the war in Afghanistan. But even more weary of the war in Afghanistan are the American public. And I don't think the American public after 2014 are going to pay for the Afghan National Security Forces for very long. Kabul cannot afford an army of the size it has. And it comes down to blood and treasure. I'm, I take a harsh line now. I think we should leave. I don't think we should pay for Afghanistan after a certain date because we've paid too much. Uh, I'm sorry to say it, but I think uh, a BBC journalist was right um, when he wrote the book uh, Butcher and Bolt. I think that was what should have happened in 2001, 2002. And what we've done in Afghanistan since then has been largely a waste of time for me, and I've lost friends there, and I don't want to pay any more. Um. So what was your name? Name? David Page. Thanks, David. David, because uh, it's funny, I was actually just sitting trying to get my closing remarks ready, and you gave me the opportunity to come in with them now. Um, <laughs> when, uh, because what I was going to say was, when we try to make sense of what happened in Afghanistan, or even make sense of what the foreigners did in Afghanistan from the perspective of you know, when it's over, when there's um, you know, well beyond 20, 2014, um, uh, I think that we'll, tr what we'll, we'll try and distinguish what happened in 2001, 2002, and the, uh, now we can call them the, the early years, the, the response to 9-11, the toppling of the Taliban regime, the Bonn conference, the uh, establishment of new uh, political institutions, and in now as I you know, look back to the good bits, I mean, to the I mean there, was, you know, um, uh, uh, in there was an incredibly participatory and democratic process um, you know, in those early years at setting, setting things going. Um, and tremendous Afghan response to it, and almost no Western military boots on the ground, 
And actually, if you're going to talk cost-effectiveness, incredibly cost-effective. I mean, even, even if you put the accountants all over that intervention, I think you'll find that for what was achieved in terms of giving Afghans a decent chance of moving forward, that, that intervention actually worked remarkably, you know, remarkably well. And, there, and there's still, there'll be a list of things that could have been done better. Um, and then we'll try and make sense of the counterinsurgency. And that's not 2001, 2002. That's happened what happened in 2004, 2005. Because in a sense, the, the, you know, the Western military intervention in Afghanistan in, you know, that you have agonized over paying for and that we've all seen friends die over, um, I mean, that wasn't 2000. That's not the story of 2001, 2, and 3. And I think we're going to have to make sense of what happened. When did we take the decision? actually to go to put lots of boots on the ground when do we take the decision that you know there is an insurgency here and the right way to deal with this insurgency uh, is to commit a hundred thousand foreign troops and spend a trillion dollars for it because they and then when you ask who took the decision who did they ask yeah and who yeah we, yeah and yeah will there'll be there's be some interesting stories about what happened in terms of democratic democratic decision making in the you know, in countries on this side of the world and yeah when we ask the afghans well you asked, um, and then you know, from from, you know, from the perspective of a few years hence, we say, well, given the output, I mean, there was no value for money there um, because you know we spent. I, mean, I I did one calculation when I was talking in the U.S. I said, um, now what I know of the Taliban in the field at the moment, I reckon you're investing 95 million U.S. dollars per enemy per year. I said, there've got to be better ways of doing this. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, up, I mean, yeah the, the cost effectiveness, I mean, got, I mean, yes, too much blood and treasure, and it didn't go the right way, and nobody's happy about it, and except a few people who made an awful lot of money along the, uh, along the way. But we shouldn't trash the idea of responding to the situation which existed at the end of 2001. I mean, and we should remember the word, I mean, the, the, some, you know, the good bit of the story we can see around there. Um, and I'm afraid that they, you know, that they, we, I, I have, we have difficulty in explaining the martyrs um, for, some, for some of the, the, the recent years. And we have to look very hard to say, okay, remember, okay, still, that, was, that did help some of the good story continue. But um, I think we will deeply, we, you know, we will radically rethink the way that any future intervention should be handled. Thank you very much. No, 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 we just start a few minutes late. So... Just one more, yeah. And uh, where should we go? Should we, let's go right to the back. So the Taliban for the last one year. Uh, so it's actually interesting because it's, it seems as the, uh, the Pakistani side of the story never gets told. And obviously we don't have the time to do it. And Pakistani military doesn't really get a voice. Uh, <clears throat> just two days ago we lost the general officer commanding Sawat division who was my GOC in an IED attack, which is, la which is the highest... Military, serving military officer lost in the conflict. Uh, just, just give a thought when you talk about the ISI and the Pakistani military. It's just, do you think you know the Pakistani military is, is composed of mad people who get up in the morning and say, "Well, we'll kill four Afghans for breakfast and have four more for dinner." It's not like that. We've been fighting the Taliban for the last ten years, and I have served in North Waziristan. I'm coming from. Deer, which is on the border, and I can assure you <clears throat> that we had strict instructions all throughout these years that not a single person from the Pakistani side should cross to the Afghan side. It's a very difficult terrain. People who've seen the terrain, it's not possible to control that area. But let me also tell you that we, we've suffered so many attacks from the Afghan side coming into the Pakistan side, where the Sawat chapter of the Taliban is based in Kunar province. And I'm not going to start a propaganda war here, but I just want to tell like, the people to think, and the Afghan Taliban is an Afghan phenomena. Yes, we supported the Afghan Taliban when they reached Kabul in 1996, but it was purely an Afghan phenomena which started in 1996. We supported the Mujahideen in the 80s, yes, so just last, just a last comment. Uh, what the Afghan Taliban have achieved in terms of military success with NATO, 40 countries fighting in Afghanistan, you see it's beyond Pakistan's capability even to give that kind of a support to Afghan Taliban with which they can defeat the US and its allies. So just, just give a thought to what, what this is. Yeah. Very, very glad you made that point. Thank you very much.
made your contribution, unusual to get that perspective. And can you, can you um, comment, comment on that? On, on the Pakistani army? Well, um, what the Afghans are um, saying, not from 96 when the Taliban went to uh, Kabul, but uh, right from 94 when uh, um, uh, Babur, I can't remember his first name, uh, Nasrallah Babur, yeah, Nasrallah Babur wanted to um, help a Pakistani convoy to go to Central Asia, and uh, he wanted to get rid of those commanders. So, I mean, there are stories that uh, they, um, they created the Taliban. Right now, I mean, you talked about the um, North Waziristan or South Waziristan. In South Waziristan, yes, there are Pakistani Taliban uh, against them, the Pakistani military operated. But in the North Waziristan, where Haqqani groups are based, no one bothered to go there. I mean, for, for ages, the Pakistani army is saying that they will uh, start an operation there, but they never uh, bothered there. Um, so, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on that uh, everybody, including the NATO, um, believe that uh, the Pakistani army is not doing enough. Okay, it's a somewhat contentious point to end on, but I'm uh, <laughs> very, very grateful for what's been, a, I surely you'll agree, a very, very well-informed and uh, excellent panel. So thank you very, very much for all your contributions and for your questions. Thank you.